so today as you all are aware that uh, we are doing a small session one hour session on the newly issued igcr rules uh, which have been issued on 9th of september and uh, they have been uh, uh, enforced from 10th of september uh, but yet there is no clarity on the same today we are standing on 15th of september uh, so we are about to discuss the changes which have come in the new rules which have come in i am shweta i have along with me jain sir also uh, who is uh, the managing partner of rsa legal solutions so we both will be hosting this webinar and uh, we'll be running the slides after this uh, wherever you have any problems will you can uh, ask the question per slide um, uh, also and you will give you the rights to unmute yourself so please don't unmute unnecessarily because that will create the disturbance but wherever you have the questions you please unmute yourself and then you can ask the questions or uh, um, in the end towards the end also we can take up the questions so uh, we are free both ways uh, message, to do it both ways message uh, and you can also uh, put in the message in the chat box uh, so that uh, if we are not able to answer during the session due to the paucity of time or due to some other reason then at least we can see your queries and thereafter we can try to address those queries after the webinar is over so uh, uh, just bear with me and i'll be sharing uh, my screen first I hope my screen is visible to all of you. Just a second. okay so now we are starting i am again sharing the screen now i have given all of you the rights to unmute yourselves to ask any questions uh, and now we are pro proceeding with the slides so brief introduction first will be given by jain sir and then uh, we'll take over the slides uh, good afternoon everybody as indicated by shweta we have prepared the slides and she will explain you in detail slide wise the implications difficulties benefits uh, out of these uh, new rules which have been announced recently but uh, i am just uh, uh, trying to give you the brief background of the entire uh, these rules in fact uh, it was first in 1996 when these rules were framed in the name of import of goods at concessional rate of duty for the manufacture of the excisable goods so in that set of rules the goods were permitted to be imported at concessional rate of duty if so provided by the relevant custom notification and those were necessarily to be used in the manufacturing activity at the premises of the importer but over a period of time there was certain flaws in that reason mean that it provided along that goods have to be used in the manufacturing and it did not take into account that whether those goods can be cleared for job work outside the factory or the goods could be re-exported back in case those are found to be unusable or defective or those could be transferred to another unit of the same manufacturer so therefore some uh, uh, defects were there in the initial set of rules and that continued for a long period and assessi faced a lot of problems because of that later on in 2016 those rules were substituted and new set of rules were brought into existence and in these uh, these rules certain concessions or Uh, further uh, liberalization was made to the extent that now the imported goods which were imported at concessional rate of duty so those could be re-exported back in case those are found to be defective the goods could be sent for job work outside the factory 
etc. But other, other things like execution of bond, bank guarantee, submission, maintenance of the record, submission of the return, etc. It was there and it still continued. So thereafter, then further changes were made that it is not only the manufacturing activity, but it needs to be further relaxed. And therefore, some further changes were made and a new set of rules were introduced in 2017. And 2017, after the introduction of the GST, because there was no excise duty at that point of time, so their nomenclature itself was changed. And it was made import of goods at concessional rate of custom duty rules 2017. And in these, uh, these rules, goods could be imported under concessional rate of duty if so provided by the notification for the manufacturing activity and also for providing the services. In the previous rules, the concept relating to the provision for service was not there. So now, therefore, there was extension that in addition to using the goods for manufacturing, you the goods could be used to, to uh, for providing the services. And apart from that, further relaxation were made in the sense that goods have to be used within a prescribed period in case those are found to be defective or unusable or surplus. Those could be re-exported back and option was provided ki in case he cannot do so, he can pay the duty CO motto with applicable interest. Goods can be sent outside the factory for job work. Goods can be sent to another unit of the same manufacturer. So that sort of broadly setup was there. But again, I am saying ki that benefit was available only if the relevant custom notification provided for observance of such rules in order to avail the exams. Now, in these rules, which have been uh, recently introduced on 9th of September, there is a further window open. It provides, apart from using the goods for manufacturing or providing the services, the goods can be used for specified end use. This is the new terminology they have added. What is the meaning of the specified end use? It, it means, number one, it is not necessary that as a result of that particular process, there should be a manufacturing. It may be some process which may not be uh, uh, amount to manufacture. Those goods may be used by the importer himself for that particular specified end use or even those goods can be sent to some third party. So till now, the concept of third party was not there. So I can, and in fact, these sort of problems were being faced by a number of persons in the trade and industry. Uh, I will just try to give you one or two examples. One is relating to import of paper. The paper, the importer of papers, so they, there is a concessional rate of duty. They can use it in the manufacture of newsprint, magazine, etc. But majority of the newspaper import, they themselves do not print that. So they supply it to the newspaper publications. So now that sort of arrangement can be done. Goods can be imported by A and those can be supplied to B for the purpose of publishing of newspaper and uh, magazines. Likewise, uh, in the case of gold and jewelry, the gold and uh, silver, etc., so those being very sensitive items, so those can be imported only by the nominated agencies or by the authorized banks. Third party cannot import per se. But there were notifications which provided that the goods uh, 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 can be cleared to jewelry exporters. So, so there was no mechanism to ensure that goods have been properly used. So in order to take care of such situations, so these specified end use word has also been added, meaning thereby even now, even the goods can be sold or transferred to a third party 
provided you follow the prescribed procedure and, and to ensure that goods have been put for the specified end use. No doubt, despite that, there is, are certain ambiguities even in the current rules, which will be addressed in due course of time by the government. Uh, for example, the, this starting rule itself says that the goods uh, where it is provided under notification number, uh, notification issued under section 11. So section 11 basically provides for the provision of the goods uh, in respect. So uh, we have yet to reconcile where are, which are the situation where the notification has been issued under uh, section 9, uh, section 11. So these type of things are there, which we will address separately uh, once we enter into uh, slide-wide discussion. So this is how these rules have uh, come into existence. Now, one more thing. So here the word has been used, okay, you get uh, have to get yourself registered with the jurisdictional custom officer. So what is the meaning of the jurisdictional custom officer? I would like to tell it can okay, now throughout India, jurisdiction has been made on the basis of the areas and the commissioner of custom preventives. So they, those have been made the commissioner of customs having jurisdiction over the independent units. Say for example, my unit is in Gurgaon. So I am required to execute the bond bank guarantee, get the registration, send the monthly return, etc. with the officers and working under the commissioner of customs preventive, not with the custom of com uh, uh, commissioner of custom on the respective port. Maybe I may be importing the goods from JNPT or I may be importing from the uh, goods, say, uh, Tugalkawa, etc. No. So only one place will be there and that would be the commissioner of customs having jurisdiction over that particular manufacturing facility. So these are the brighter, uh, broader issues which I wanted to explain in brief, now the Shweta will explain you uh, the procedure, laws, flaws, uh, once you go by each individual uh, slide. Thank you, sir, for the introduction, a brief introduction. So now we will start with the slide by slide uh, provisions of uh, these rules along with the procedure and uh, the uh, provisions which mm -hmm. it provides for. So the very uh, first rule, first rule, I would say basically rule number two, it specifies that where these rules are applicable. So the first point which, which it mentions is that these rules shall apply where a notification provides for observance of these rules, semicolon. Then there is B point, which says an importer intends to avail the benefit of any notification, which is dependent upon the use of imported goods for manufacture of any commodity or provision of output service or goods being put to use, put to a specified end use. So there are many things in this. One is that between the point A and B, whether both these conditions have to be simultaneously uh, fulfilled or not, it is not uh, uh, clarified whether these conditions can be read as and or they have to be read as or. So if my suppose there is a, there is an exemption notification which provides for a specified end use of a product the, and I am availing as an importer, I am availing the benefit of that notification. But those very that very notification does not provide for the observance of these rules. So will I still be covered in the in these IGCR rules or not is a question mark because Actually, if we go by the language which is given here in A and B, it even doesn't say that an importer intends to avail the benefit of such notification which provides for observance because wherein if already there was a condition imposed under A that a notification provides for observance of these rules, then in B it says an importer intends to avail the benefit of any notification. It doesn't say that the notification as mentioned in A or such notification, it doesn't use this kind of language. Neither does it mention whether these two have to be fulfilled simultaneously or uh, they have any one of them uh, would suffice for the for me to get covered under the IGCR rules. Um, this has to be compared with the uh, conditions which were there in the uh, changes which were made on 1st of February 2022, uh, in which there were massive changes brought in the IGCR rules 2016. And wherein the language in that uh, in those particular amendments 
was typically i have mentioned the language in red below so these rules shall apply to an importer who intends to avail the benefit of an exemption notification issued under subsection 1 of section 25 of the customs act and where the benefit of such exemption is dependent upon the use of imported goods covered by that notification for the manufacture of any commodity or provision of output service this was one and thereafter it was these rules shall apply only in respect of such exemption notifications which provide for observance of these rules so earlier the applicability was very very clear it very clearly said that okay there has to be an exemption notification which needs to be issued under which the benefit would be given uh, for the import of the goods and where there is an end you uh, when where the goods are to be used and the, where the goods imported goods are to be used for the either the manufacturing activity or for for the provision of an output service so there that benefit can be taken but provided that exemption notification itself provides for the observance of these rules so if that exemption notification didn't provide for the observance of these rules then in that case these rules were not applicable and i was not required to comply with these igcr rules but as of now they have completely changed the language and as you can see on the screen also that uh, uh, it does not mention whether both of these have to be simultaneously um, uh, qualified or even one would suffice though we are of the view that given by the trend which was there earlier given by the language which was there earlier maybe this could be a drafting flaw and the intention could be and only to specify that uh, both the conditions should be satisfied uh, but unless and until uh, uh, there is any clarification on this uh, so there are many many exemption notifications i would uh, many many exemptions which are there in say notification 50 by 2017 itself i have uh, myself gone through that notification and seen there at least 10 20 Uh, benefits i could find out where they were specified uh, they were subject to specified end use but then um, there was no condition imposed upon them and since there was no condition of following these igcr so do we really say that uh, these will uh, these exemptions would still be covered under this and the importer of those goods will now onwards have to comply with igcr or if we say that okay the uh, condition is and here so in that case the uh, government would intend to bring out certain um, amendment notifications which we are of the view that there are so because since there is a specific amendment um, uh, pertaining to that goods being put to a specified end use so to effectuate this and uh, there is no clarity on and or or so to effectuate this we believe that there would be a line of series of notice there should be line of notifications which should clearly provide uh, for the fact uh, whether the uh, condition the observance of these rules is required or not so uh, upon those uh, uh, amendments only uh, a person can actually an importer can actually determine whether he would be clearly covered under uh, these rules or not merely by mentioning uh, the words that goods being put to a specified end use and uh, without having any clarity on the whether uh, the uh, importer has to observe these rules or not so uh, in uh, our view uh, uh, till the time there is no clarity it's quite possible the even the customs department might ask you to comply with these rules because according to it it may take a view that this is any of the condition if it is fulfilled then in that case you have to observe the igcr so merely taking the exemption may not suffice you need to see whether you are covered under these rules or not and whether there is any specified end use attached to the product which you are importing so uh, that needs to be seen Uh, what is the definition of specified end use that is also given in these uh, rules specified end use has been defined as it means dealing with the goods imported in a manner specified in the notification and includes supply to the intended person and the term end use recipient shall be construed accordingly this is very very important because i'll just uh, read you some of the uh, uh, places where uh, the end use has been mentioned like uh, there is an entry 377a in the uh, notification 50 by 2017 which specifically says that uh, the goods shall be subject to partial exemption of uh, 10% wherein uh, it says all goods other than sim socket mechanical items metal for cell for cellular mobile phone so it says those goods and then it specifies certain items under certain hsns so all those goods which are covered under those hsns if they are to be used for cellular mobile phone then in that case they can be imported at the rate of 10% only 
and there is no condition attached to it so in that case can i say that uh, typically uh, i will be importing under this entry and thereafter i can transfer it to a person i can sell it to a person uh, who is the maybe a manufacturer of uh, mobile phone i may not be the manufacturer but there is some other person who is the manufacturer of the mobile phone and i give him uh, those goods and accordingly take the benefit of this very exemption so is that the intent so uh, and not only this there are as i told you i found out at least 10 20 uh, minimum uh, um, not exemptions uh, which are covered under this uh, this notification itself there might be other notifications also uh, where uh, the exemption is uh, subject to a uh, end use like for cellular mobile phone for motor vehicle for uh, coffee making machines so uh, these kind of uh, wherever they are specifying any end use so does it mean that even the trader of the goods wherein the person is importing selling these to these end users because it uses when we see the definition it also has an intention of um, mentioning that the, the goods can be actually sold to some other person who is the end user recipient of those goods so person who will be using those for the intended uh, purposes then in that case that will be the end user recipient but we actually need uh, clarity on this and this uh, is uh, though this is the biggest change that has been brought in these rules but this itself uh, may be due to drafting errors we might say or if there is no error we must be waiting for some notifications to be issued in future uh, which will typically clarify as to how these two conditions have to be read together so moving forward um any confusion any question on this slide maybe we can take up later on also the procedure for registration so as jain sir told that uh, once a person is covered under igcr so in that case he has to register himself specifically for taking the benefit of igcr rules in that case there is uh, on the common portal which is the ice gate portal the importer has to register himself for igcr this is a one time registration but uh, one time registration when we say we'll see in the subsequent slides also how this is one time registration typically for that very uh, unit or uh, that very product so if there are additions to be made changes to be made how those will have to be made we'll be seeing all those in subsequent slides so one time registration on the portal in form igcr1 Uh, what all uh, information needs to be given in that? It's typically like the name and address of the importer and his job worker, goods produced or processes undertaken at the manufacturing facility have to be declared uh, of the importer or his job worker both. Nature and description of the imported items, nature of output service rendered utilizing the goods imported. That these it mentions the word output service. Output service can be any domestic service also which you are providing. It can be any export of service also which you are providing. Nowhere in the customs law or in these notifications it is mentioned that particular that service has to be exported only. So it can be uh, for anything. particulars of the notification applicable on such import so the benefit of the notification which you will be taking on such imports uh, those also you have to declare at the time of the not, uh, registration itself as i told you uh, that uh, these uh, the registration itself you can later on amend also if there is any other notification that comes up for which you are wanting to take the benefit so particular of the premises intended to be used in case of unit transfer these rules also permit the unit transfer of the imported goods so we'll be dealing in detail uh, in the subsequent slides details of end use recipient in case where goods are imported are supplied for end use as i mentioned in the previous slide also that these goods which are mentioned for specified for some end use they can be supplied further also so in that case if a person if an importer is wanting to take a benefit of any exemption notification uh, wherein he has to observe we wherein uh, igcr is applicable on him i'm not specifically using the word observe igcr rules because till now we ourselves or anybody in fact would not be clear as to whether those both the conditions have to be uh, uh, fulfilled simultaneously or any one would suffice so if igcr is applicable on him then in that case uh, he will import the goods 
he will get himself registered uh, on uh, for the igcr he will comply with the igcr provisions and he will transfer he will supply those goods for the specified end use uh, to some other person so basically trading itself also is covered here uh, which was not there uh, till now this is from 10th of september only the intended ports of import so from wherever you are intending to import those uh, uh, goods you have to mention those ports of import also uh, all these details in the registration they are amendable and as and when there is any change in these uh, uh, declarations so uh, you can do, uh, do those changes you can uh, amend your registration accordingly on the portal itself uh once you uh, do the registration there will be an iin generated for you uh, for one gst registration like say an importer has 10 different units in uh, 10 different states then in that case uh, one the uh, iin will be specific to each gst number so in that case he will have typically 10 uh, iins uh, we'll be dealing with those uh, in subsequent slides also Uh, let's first go through the uh, substantive part and then we'll be seeing this procedural part submission of continuity bond with such surety or security before the jurisdictional customs authority with an undertaking to pay the differential duty so uh, along with this the person will have to give a continuity bond along with the surety or uh, security with the uh, jurisdictional customs authority jensar has already pointed out as to who are the jurisdictional customs authority i would for the uh, jurisdictional customs authority have also been defined uh, uh, in these rules and the definition given uh, under these rules is typically it means an officer of customs of a rank equivalent to the rank of superintendent or appraiser exercising jurisdiction over the premises where either the goods imported shall be put to use for manufacture or for rendering output services uh, second is the primary address where specify uh, address specified in the ic by dgft in other cases so in other cases means where the importer himself is not the manufacturer is not rendering any output service but he is typically uh, transferring or say, uh, uh, supplying those goods for the, for the specified end use then in that case uh, it will be the primary address which is specified in the ic uh, who will uh, uh, the jur uh, the jurisdictional custom officers of that particular address will be called the uh, will have the jurisdiction over him uh, again to repeat because some people have joined later also after jain sir's uh, brief introduction so uh, the uh, customs commissioners uh, over the ports they are not the jurisdictional customs officer jurisdictional customs officer is typically your area based uh, jurisdiction wherever you are located your unit is located so over that area customs preventive of that particular area will have the jurisdiction over you you might be importing from any uh, port so it's not that if you are importing goods from four ports so four different commissioners of different ports will be having the jurisdiction over you it will be your area uh, pre customs preventive officer Officers will which who will be having the jurisdiction over you before whom you will have to uh, 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 submit the bond and uh, other details. So going back here, uh, when I say continuity bond and all, so basically this bond has to be first filled in online. Thereafter, you have to execute in physical form before the jurisdictional authorities. They will approve your bond details over the system. which you can see which your jurisdictional customs officers can see which even the um, uh, officers at the port at the time of import of goods they can see as to what are your bond details how much is the balance how much is debit how much is credit they all can see so this that is the uh, purpose of going uh, making it online um apart from this uh, the um, as regards the surety or security also there are certain guidelines which are mentioned these are same as earlier uh, guidelines only which were mentioned but uh, just for the sake of uh, clarity and uh, i i'm just going through in brief so it says that uh, um, for some people uh, it says that bank guarantee oblique cash security that, that is not required surety is also not required so amongst them is the government departments if the goods are imported by government departments or the importers who are uh, au operators uh, authorized economic operators having au certificate it does not say t1 t2 t3 but it says all importers who are au so for them for the purposes of igcr there is no requirement to 
गिव एनी बैंक गारंटी कैश सिक्योरिटी और एनी श्योरिटी दे कैन मेयरली एग्जीक्यूट दी बॉन्ड एंड दैट वुड सफाइस ऑल इम्पोर्टर्स हुआ नॉमिनेटेड एजेंसीज फॉर द इम्पोर्ट ऑफ गोल्ड अंडर इंडिया यू ए सेपा सो फॉर देम ऑल्सो इट्स नॉट रिक्वायर्ड then uh, designated banks nominated by rbi as well as public sector undertakings importing under then there is two notification 56 by 2057 for them also nothing is required but there are certain conditions which they need to fulfill uh, before uh, uh, executing any kind of bank guarantee or surety um, the now for the general uh, other importers so it says all importers who are manufacturers or service providers registered under gst and have been regularly filing uh, gst return returns without fail and whose annual turnover is more than one year then in that case only surety will su suffice they need not give any uh, bank guarantee or cash security however if there is no surety who can stand for them then in that case they need to give a bank guarantee or cash security uh, of not more than 5% of the bond debit value and importers who are not covered and un covered under all uh, five situations above then in that case the bank guarantee oblique cash security has been prescribed as 25% so it's not the arbitrariness of the customs officer that they can demand full value uh, cash security or bank guarantee they have to this is since this is coming from the circular they have to abide by that circular itself any questions on this slide yeah i have one question uh, yes, sir. yeah shweta yes, that sir. how because the functionality of seeking registration is not yet available on ice gate it seems uh no the sir uh, ice gate uh, it is available once you log in there after i'll be taking you to those slides also there okay, is one okay. tab of igcr which you okay. need to click and there first you need to then you will be able to register on that and uh, what about the eous since we already have a bond submitted with customs officers <laughs> so that particular bond will <laughs> be sufficient for them to accept <laughs> or we need to file as a new bond with them yes uh, sir in fact it has always been a some sort of contentious issue <laughs> correct the last sir. time also board has issued a separate clarification uh -huh. saying that because the eou executed master bond that is b17 b17 correct sir and that will cover that will take care of even the, the bond required under these rules okay and be, be, and in these rule itself they have specified as a one rule which says that all the circulars instructions which have been issued in the previous rules so mm -hmm. those will be valid for these rules also unless those are inconsistent with the, these rules okay okay meaning thereby that you you is not required to execute the separate bond however in, in view of the previous clarification however one point here to note is that though it specifically provides that uh, the uh, all those circulars will be uh, valid but these very rules they per se supersede the earlier rules of 2016 so these will be the new rules but circulars and clarifications which have been issued they will uh, uh, be valid they even will keep on even, even references, references to very, very even valid. references to like if there is any earlier notification which says ah, yes. uh, observance of the igcr 2017 uh, so in that case uh, uh, that has to be read as igcr 2022 for example in your eou notification itself notification number 50 by 2052 by 2003 so there is a mention that eou will follow the import of goods at concessional rate of duty rules 2017 correct theek hai na so because that rule is there even though that rules is not amended it, it will automatically mean import of goods at concessional rate of duty 2022 by virtue of specific provision Same. carved out in the uh, in these rules okay okay thank you sir hello yeah yes sir yeah uh, good afternoon good afternoon Yeah, we have been registered on the IGCI portal, mm -hmm. and we are we have been filling out the monthly returns. Okay. So, and we fall into the category of the end use. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. After this notification, seventy four by two two zero two zero two two, 
So do we have to mention somewhere on the iSkate portal the list of all the clients? Uh, see, sir, a uh, list of all uh, the people to whom you would be selling the goods. That is what you are saying. Yes, correct. Okay. So as of now, um, in uh, since this is a very very new rule, and they have specifically mentioned in the circular itself, which has uh, which has been issued to clarify some aspects of these rules, uh, which okay. says that uh, the uh, desired changes in the portal will be carried out in due course of time, and plus there will be some standing instructions, also some clarifications and uh, um, uh, advisories uh, being issued by the ICE Gate and other. Uh, uh, um, like a CBIC and all also. So as of now, nothing has been issued, but they have said that desired uh, changes in the portal uh, will have to be carried out. Uh, why I'm saying so that you will have to declare is because there are provisions in these IGCR uh, forms itself, which says, and the provisions itself, which says that uh, you will have as as was the case with the job worker. Earlier also, there was a specific tab for the job worker, Thanks. wherein you were required to mention the job worker details completely, his registration number, GST registration number, his uh, address, uh, what kind of process activity he would be undertaking okay. and all that stuff. Fine. So on similar lines, there would be a separate tab for unit transfer also. There would be a separate tab for the uh, people uh, to your, for, pertaining to your customers to whom you would be se uh, selling your goods. Job work also. Okay. Job work, it's already there. Right. Yeah. Okay. And one more thing, like we fall into the category of actual users. So okay. you mentioned in the bond and bank guarantee slide that we do not have to uh, give both surety bond and the bank guarantee. But uh, when in the March, IGCR was implemented by customs. So we were asked to give both the things. No, uh, but actual user is not a condition for no, not giving. Are you the AU? AU? Yes, we are the AU. AU, okay, okay, okay. No, you are not supposed to. Uh, in March, you gave uh, last yeah. year. Okay. Yeah. And how much is the quantum of the bank guarantee and uh, cash security, whatever so, you have? Approximately, which I remember is we gave around 20 25% of the. 20 25%. Yes. Okay. 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 So uh, uh, that we can check whether uh, uh, these provisions these were earlier also, but it could it could be possible that uh, these provisions were issued there after first March because uh, first March implementations were uh, due to the provisions which were brought out in on first of February in the budget. Yes. But after first March itself, there were various circulars uh, which were promulgated, and I think this particular thing was uh, uh, maybe after that. Okay. That could be possible. Okay. Okay. So now I'm moving forward. Uh, procedure for import. So we saw procedure for registration. Now we are seeing what is the procedure for import. It's very simple process. Uh, wherein at the time of import, the importer is required to mention the IIN and continuity bond number in the bill of entry at the time of import itself. Uh, thereafter, once you mention your IIN and continuity bond number, then in that case, the officer will allow you the benefit of the notification as mentioned in the IIN because um, you must have seen in the earlier slide also, I mentioned uh, um, wherein the declarations uh, were required to be given in that you were supposed to mention your notification number uh, uh, itself in the registration also, uh, what benefit you would be taking of which notification. So uh, um, merely by mentioning the notification number in the bill of entry and not in IIN, will not entitle you to give the benefit. You need to register that notification in IIN also. And thereafter, at the time of filing the bill of entry, uh, you need to mention that IIN and accordingly, the uh, officer will allow the uh, benefit. Bond gets debited automatically on the portal and are available with the jurisdictional customs authority. So once you enter the bond number in the bill of entry, uh, so thereafter, the bond value to the extent of the uh, duty benefit which you are taking, that will be debited automatically over the portal. And that can be seen by your jurisdictional customs authority. Definitely the port authorities are there. They will then and there itself, they can see, but jurisdictional customs authority also can see, ki, okay, you have imported the goods. You have uh, mentioned all the details of your IIN and thereafter, uh, this is the value of the benefit that you are taking. And uh, therefore the bond amount has been debited. So this will be automatic. A procedure for allowing imported goods for job work. So how once you have... Yeah, oh, Shweta, sorry to disturb yes. you. I'm yes. having one question here. Yes, sir. The bond amount gets debited 
but how the bond amount is going to be credited sir uh, bond amount uh, i have it in my uh, uh, subsequent slides subsequent uh, slide but is still there. i'll okay. tell you uh, yeah uh, subsequent slide number five okay, okay. <laughs> i'll okay, tell okay, you subsequent okay. slides ah, yes, okay oh, oh, yes, sir. procedure for allowing imported goods for job work so uh, since uh, job uh, sending the goods for job work is allowed under these rules uh, for uh, complying with the procedure you first need to disclose in your monthly return as a part of the compliances uh, uh, for igcr uh, importer has to file the monthly returns so that disclosure of sending the goods to the job work has to be there in the monthly return needless to mention here that job worker details have to be registered in your iif if the job worker details are not registered definitely uh, uh, it will create problem uh, while filing your monthly return itself goods can be kept in the premise of the job worker for 6 months only so not more than that under these rules though as per gst law uh, it is one year and two year accordingly but if you are taking the benefit of this notification they have to be brought back within 6 months only you have to follow the procedure under gst law for the goods uh, for sending the goods like on delivery chalan on e way bill um, um, all that procedure needs to be followed and uh, then there are certain obligations which are passed on the uh, job worker also wherein he will account for the receipt of the goods manufacturing process and wastage which i presume in any case even if these rules were not there he must be doing it under uh, uh, gst law and other laws produce the account details before the jurisdictional customs officer as and when required by the said officer so this here jurisdictional customs officer means the jurisdictional customs officer of the importer so in that case if he requires uh, some de details some accounts of the job worker job worker has to produce uh, those details also send the processed goods to the importer or another job worker after carrying out job work so he can send back the goods to the importer or he can if the goods are required to be further processed then from first job worker the goods can be sent to the other job worker also uh, important to note here that there is one leg which is missing in these rules which is what if the importer the last leg of the processing is being done at the job worker and thereafter if the goods have to be finally exported are to or are to be supplied uh, to some other customer here in india only ultimate customer so in that case these rules are silent they don't provide for that kind of contingency that kind of provision wherein from the job worker premise itself you can supply the goods further meaning thereby uh, since this has not been specifically provided we understand that the good importer will have to bring back those goods within 6 months only there is no provision for extension of these 6 months so he will have to bring back uh, those goods and uh, thereafter uh, he will have to supply those goods either to the uh, uh, either in india or outside india whatever wherever he is supplying so uh, these Sorry. yes is there any list for the goods which we can import for the job work like the our license for importers we are the actual users so our license is we are only authorized to import goods based on the actual user condition mm -hmm. so is there any specified list no, issued no, by there the is, there is no specified list for it actual user actually doesn't mean typically that they have to be uh, even if the goods are being sent for some processing outside your premise and they are being brought back into your premise for being used in as your final output or being used in the process of your final output so then in that case also they are being actually used by you only you at okay. any cost cannot say that they are being used by someone else in that case so being specific for my industry does gold or gold ore fall into the category of this uh, job work <laughs> like we can import sir uh, job work uh, in the de definition of job work it's an exception okay <laughs> gold <laughs> itself is a very very different item so yes, that's why i was <laughs> yes so uh, we'll be covering those gold related we have slides for gold related items also okay yeah. now inter unit transfer Uh, as we saw the provision for job work uh, similar is the uh, process for uh, uh, sending the goods for uh, inter unit transfer uh, one uh, difference here in inter unit transfer visa vis the job work is that uh, for inter unit transfer there is no uh, time limit within which the goods have to be received back 
as it was in the case of job work. So uh, if you are sending for job work within six months, you have to get them back. But if you are sending to your inter unit, uh, if there is any inter unit transfer of those goods, then in that case, there is no limit prescribed. However, again, it does not mean here that you don't have to receive them because uh, you will have to receive these goods because uh, the obligations which are cast on the importer. Uh, it uh, specifically says that uh, importer has to get them back um, or he can send those goods for further job work from the uh, uh, other unit where uh, he has sent them. So uh, here also that particular loophole, whether from the uh, other unit, I can send the goods, uh, supply the goods uh, here in India or export the goods uh, that has not been catered to. So we do understand that in this case also, they have to be returned. So you can basically this inter unit transfer also unit, the other unit typically acts as your job worker only because there have to be some processes which the other unit will have to carry out. And uh, thereafter they have will have to be returned to the importer's premise or for further job work. So it's not that you are importing uh, the GS, the IIN is in the name of one unit and uh, thereafter it just transfers the goods to other unit who does not have the IIN and um, and the matter ends and you say that you have filed the returns and all under um, IGCR and thereafter you have complied with it the answer is no you have to get those goods back to you so which typically implies basically that the other unit also does some sort of processing otherwise uh, there is no requirement for you to send those goods to the other unit and then get them back per se. Uh, but yes, there is no time limit which is mentioned here for inter-unit transfer. Uh, important, uh, if you are sending the goods for uh, uh, end-use recipient, to the end-use recipient, because as we saw in our earlier slides that this is a major deviation from the uh, earlier rules that this is allowing the goods to be sold to the end use recipient. So in that case, the only compliance, the only uh, conditions which are there mentioned in these rules is that I have to disclose that in my monthly return, uh, that to whom I'm giving, it's basically invoice wise, bill of entry wise details, to whom I'm selling, all those details will also come. And I have to follow the procedure specified under the GST law for the supply of goods. So whatever in uh, like under the GST law, I'm supposed to raise an invoice, I'm supposed to generate an e-way bill, I'm supposed to generate uh, an e-invoice. So whatever are the compliances procedures to be followed under GST law uh, that I need to comply with. And I have to disclose in the monthly return under IGCR. Needless to mention here again that uh, though as of now that facility of entering the details of your end customer, end use recipient is not there on the portal, but definitely that will be there because that is the only way to monitor as to how the uh, goods are being used for that specified uh, purpose only. So in that case, once that tab comes, inter-unit transfer tab and the specified end use tab. So in that case, uh, you will have to disclose those details uh, in your IIN also, in the registration itself as to who will be your customer, to whom these goods will be sold. But other than that, unlike the job work and inter-unit, there is no condition uh, specific in this. Um, there is a specific provision for treatment of uh, defective goods or, un, uh, just a second. Yeah, defective goods so in the, or unutilized goods. So if you have imported the goods, either those are defective or at one point in time, you come to the conclusion, maybe you're not having sufficient um, uh, outward orders or something that uh, your raw material or your goods which you have imported, capital goods which you have uh, imported, uh, they remain unutilized. So in that case, both the options have been given. Um, you can re-export also. Uh, you can clear them for home consumption also. So re-export is permitted uh, within the specified period of six months and uh, thereafter, which can be further extended for three months. But there is no provision for any further uh, enhanced uh, extension over this. So maximum period, if we say, then that for re-export is typically nine months. Otherwise, you cannot re-export those defective or unutilized goods. 
Uh, moreover, uh, when the extension has to be sought, uh, you will have to give uh, uh, sufficient reasons to your jurisdictional authority as to why you need the extension and why those could not be re-exported within six months. But I uh, think uh, that can be done. Um, then thereafter, if you're not re-exporting and you're wanting to clear them for home consumption, maybe because the cost of re-export itself might be very high uh, or due to any other logistical or commercial issues. So in that case, you can clear them for home consumption also on the payment of applicable duty along with interest uh, within the time as available for re-export. So uh, for home <coughs> consumption also, uh, you will have to pay the duty along with the interest. Um, provisions also provide for uh, clearance of capital goods. Um, so if you have imported the capital goods and taken um, and you are, you are supposed to be complying with the IGCR because the notification so requires and you have taken the benefit of some notification, then in that case, the capital goods can be cleared on payment of differential duty along with interest on the depreciated value allowed in straight line method. So, uh, and uh, such clearance, uh, you will have to uh, disclose in your return also, IGCR 3 also. And uh, thereafter, the depreciation rates, which it has given, uh, they have specified the depreciation rates also. Uh, important is that depreciation will be allowed from the uh, date when the capital goods have come into use up to the date of its clearance. So it's not that when you imported those capital goods and uh, till the date of clearance, you claim a higher depreciation. Uh, if you if you've imported the capital goods and thereafter say for five months, uh, they are just lying idle and nothing has been done on them. And thereafter they have been put to use. Then the dep depreciation shall start from the uh, sixth month on fifth, uh, after five months only till the date of its clearance. That is how the depreciation would be calculated. Uh, yes, for gold, uh, there is uh, uh, not in the rules, but in the circular which has been issued, um, uh, they, um, sorry. <coughs> they specify uh, certain clarifications with respect to the gold import. So we all know that uh, under recently India has concluded a UA, uh, it's a FTA with a UAE, uh, which was made effective from 1st of May 2022. Uh, there are a host of items, a uh, long list of items on which benefits have been uh, accorded for the import of uh, goods from UAE. And uh, obviously, one of the most crucial item um, where, uh, uh, which is mentioned is the import of gold. But uh, gold is subject to the uh, TRQ. TRQ is tariff rate quota. So it's not that anyone can import uh, gold up to any quantity from UAE. So you will have to get your quota fixed from the DGFT office and the quota which is allocated uh, to you, only that much gold can be imported by you. So this was just a brief background as to why this has been given here. Uh, so it says the clarification which has been issued here is that importer, uh, which in most cases would be the nominated agency shall follow IGCR for import of good, uh, gold and supply the gold to end use recipients who are TRQ holders. So uh, till now, what was happening is that the nominated agencies, um, as Jen sir mentioned that uh, they used to import the gold, but then actually they were not the actual consume, actual manufacturers of gold jewelry or uh, um, uh, they were not the actual users of gold. So in that case, though they were allowed to import, but then actually what to do with that, it was not very clear with them. So uh, therefore, um, the uh, now this has been made clear because TRQ was basically uh, being taken by uh, various other uh, importers also. So it's now made clear that in such cases, now uh, nominated agencies can import, they follow the IGCR, they can supply the gold to the recipients who are TRQ holders. So this chain was missing and therefore that was causing a great hardship, a big hardship to the uh, nominated agencies like MMTC and all who were importing the gold, but uh, they were not able to sell the gold to the TRQ holders. Now with these uh, provisions in place, with these IGCR uh, rules in place, they will be able to do that. The importer having provided a one-time intimation in form IGCR, one can generate IIN and undertake multiple imports against the same. 
the details of the end use recipient to be mentioned in IGCR1. So this is uh, uh, the same thing which I have mentioned for other importers also, which he will have, he will also have to comply the nominated agencies. Apart from this, the imports pertaining to multiple TRQ holders can be clubbed together and imported in a single lot. Uh, however, it is to be ensured that file while filing BOE, the quantities against each TRQ holder need to be mentioned as a separate line item. So uh, there, is a comp there is a nominated agency, say MMTC, and in that case, it uh, intends to import uh, um, gold from UAE, uh, which typically uh, it intends to supply to various other TRQ holders. It is not that MMTC is not the TRQ holder, it is the nominated agency only. So in that case, if, uh, um, if uh, uh, in that case, uh, the, on behalf of all the TRQ holders, uh, if it is importing the gold, then in that case, in the bill of entry itself, it will have to be uh, mentioned line line item by line item uh, for each TRQ holder. And uh, however, the entire thing can be clubbed together and that can be imported in a single uh, bill of entry in a single lot itself. Supply to each TRQ holder is to be disclosed in the monthly return. Uh, this is typically to align it with the bill of entry. Uh, the quantities uh, uh, which are supplied so that there is can be no uh, um, hanky panky thing uh, as to you imported uh, some higher quantity and thereafter uh, you supply to some other person. Importer shall importer shall follow IGCR procedure till it's supply to end use recipient and filing monthly statement. So the only uh, its role ends there when he files the monthly statement. He will follow the procedure. He will file the monthly return, and uh, his uh, uh, he is basically complied with the IGCR in that case. So this is specifically for the gold import that clarification has come up. Uh, records which Excuse are required. Me. Hello. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. One thing in the last slide. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, the nominated agencies can import the gold from the UAE and supply to the TRQ holders. Mm -hmm. So, is it possible for the TRQ holders to import the gold and give it on the job work? And what are the what are the nominated agencies defined by the customs? Can you elaborate on that? Okay, sir, uh, I will try to clarify. In fact, gold being a sensitive item, so therefore it can be imported by the nominated agency. Nominated agency means the government, you know, if you see the foreign trade policy, then MMTC, STC, uh, some banks, uh, HDFC bank, state bank, etc. So there is a list of around 10, 11 agencies, okay. so, which are called nominated agencies. Okay. So the gold per se cannot be imported by any other person, individual. Okay. So it can be imported only by the nominated agency. This is the first principle. Okay. Second is okay, now because the government has entered into an agreement with the UAE and in that item, list of items, gold is one of the items. Correct. Where you can import the gold at a concessional rate of duty and on the basis of that TR, TR, tariff rate quota. So, okay. because so far as the gold is concerned, there may be hundreds or thousands of the persons uh, making jewelry or dealing in gold who are maybe intending to import the gold against the TR, whatsoever quota is loaded. So, it cannot be indefinitely. So, therefore, one rule is prescribed that they will be have to take the TRQ from the DGFT office on particular quantity which have been allowed to eat uh, person so only he, he can import that much quantity but he cannot import it directly so he has to procure it from the nominated agencies alone so, so therefore what the nominated agency can do is they can collab the total quantity suppose with the mmtc 100 uh, jewelry manufacturer they uh, approached with the tr okay for, for me it is 10 kg for me it is 20 kg 30 kg so they calculate ki, okay total amount becomes a two ton so mmtc will import the two ton uh, two metric ton of the gold and it will distribute that gold among, amongst the various trq holders okay so this is how the scheme will work so basically the trq holders can also can't also directly import the gold 
Yeah. So they have to go through the nominated agencies only. Yes, yes, yes you are right. And do we have, do, is it possible for us to give on the goal on job work, the imported goal under the yes. PIQ quota? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. So, so there is a clarification in the uh, circular itself, sure, sure. which says that uh, the uh, job work restrictions typically they are for the person who is uh, following the I, for the importer who is following the IGCR. But when it is sold to the end use recipient, in that case they can uh, uh, they can uh, they need not follow this IG, uh, IGCR. Yeah, they, they can IGCR they can, they, can, they can send it for the job. Job, job yes. Okay. Fine. There is no restriction for, uh, for them. Okay. So these are typically the records to be maintained. I really need not uh, go through them as to because these are uh, typical kind of records. Quantity and quantity of goods consumed, quantity of goods entered and received after job work and nature of so. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay Returns and forms. One is IGCR one. This is the prior intimation that I mentioned. Uh, one time approval. IGCR two is if there is any non or short receipt of goods uh, imported by the importer. So in that case, he has to fill IGCR two. Otherwise, there will be a disconnect between his bill of entry and the monthly return, which typically he would be filing. So um, uh, say uh, if he is importing uh, some uh, hundred units of a particular item, uh, but when it comes to his premises, he sees it as only ninety units. So thereafter, when he files the IGCR three, which is the monthly statement, in that case, uh, because he also has to mention the bill of entry details. Uh, um, so in that case, uh, if he does not account for those uh, ten units specifically, so uh, there will be a disconnect. So uh, IGCR two specifically provides that uh, uh, you have to report your uh, short or non receipt of uh, goods which you have imported after taking the benefit in IGCR two. It doesn't specify any other thing. IGCR three is your monthly statement, monthly return which you have to file, uh, which is a very very exhaustive return. Three. And an important point is IGCR three A, and this is the immediate recredit. And I'll also mention about the normal uh, credit of the board also here. So uh, earlier, what was happening is uh, that uh, the uh, bond amount, uh, like first the bond amount would be debited at the time of your import. And thereafter, uh, now also, once you file your uh, monthly return, thereafter, as soon as you account for your uh, uh, material which you have imported uh, and tra trace them to your uh, bill of entry, thereafter, the uh, amount which has been debited in your bond will automatically get credited. But sometimes it's quite possible uh, that an importer may not be wanting to wait for the monthly return because there are some other uh, uh, imports which are scheduled for him during that month only, and uh, uh, he has a limited value of the bond. So in that case, uh, there is an additional provision which has been provided, which talks about uh, where the where he can furnish the details of the consumption of goods at any point in time for immediate recredit of the bond. So in such case, he will file IGCR 3A uh, on the portal and immediately the bond amount will get credited. So uh, say for example, the bond amount earlier was say one CR, he imported certain goods uh, wherein the duty saved amount was say 90 lakhs and uh, leaving a balance of only uh, 10 lakhs. And uh, um, now, if during the month he again has to import uh, some uh, goods from outside, wherein again that duty involved, duty saved amount would typically be say 50 lakhs. So now he cannot do that under that bond because it does not have that much cushion. Only 10 lakh was left. So in such a case, um, uh, if uh, he can, uh, for immediate recredit of the bond, he can file IGCR 3A and immediately he will get the recredit of the bond and he will have to furnish all the details. Uh, IGCR 3A typically is furnishing the details of your consumption. So if you can provide uh, those details uh, at that point in time, it will be good. Your bond amount will be recredited. Otherwise, they will be recredited after you file the monthly return. Uh, secondly, if 
even if say after filing the monthly return you get the recredit and still the bond amount is less because you need to import certain high value items and uh, thereafter uh, and which involves uh, a lot of duty saved amount and bond value is not according to it so in that case case you can also go for the amendment of the bond also and the bond can be amended online and uh, uh, once the, it's amended online uh, after satisfying your jurisdictional uh, um, customs authority furnishing him uh, the additional bond details and uh, surety security bank guarantee whatsoever and he will approve on the system and uh, you can uh, increase your bond amount also uh, online only uh, now i'm just running through uh, the brief uh, uh, process on the ice gate portal as to how it looks like this is not a i've not captured all these uh, uh, like uh, options which are given there because else it will be too lengthy but yes to give you a feel of the uh, how this process will work so uh, that i have captured here which is very so, important yes so once you log into your ice gate portal you will see something like this igcr here uh, you will have to click here <clears throat> after this uh, there will be as of now there are four tabs definitely uh, they could increase uh, depending upon the uh, changes introduced in these rules prior intimation bond details uh, oblique top up short receipt and file monthly return so once you click prior intimation you will receive this kind of screen uh, wherein there is new prior intimation once you click this new prior intimation i will move to the subsequent uh, slide but uh, if you see here itself there are various iians mentioned here uh, and there are various iians against uh, these specific gst numbers so these are basically one importer having many uh, gst numbers in different states and for each so uh, each specific gst number he has to generate an iian so it will be qua your gst registration once you click on prior intimation uh, these four tabs as of now are appearing uh, manufacturer details goods to be imported goods to be manufactured <clears throat> and job work details so once you click manufacturer details you have to mention all your details here ic name gst in state district commissionerate division at the <clears throat> process undertaken at the manufacturing uh, uh, unit thereafter you will move to the goods to be imported here it is to be noted that uh, for every good which you want to import uh, you have to mention it uh, cth wise um, and also the notification number wise also the port of import wise so say suppose if you are importing goods under say chapter 85 in that case uh, and you are wanting to import that from two ports two different ports so in that case first you will have to mention this in serial number 1 those details port one port of import you will mention thereafter you will add row with the same details you will mention the second port of import also if the quantity assuming quantity of goods and other things remain same uh, here again if uh, for one cth uh, if you are taking the benefit of two different notifications uh, um, at different points in time so there also you need to mention uh, two different row items if there are different cth then you need to make needless to say you will have to keep on adding those uh, uh, subsequent rows right. so it's good to be as exhaustive as possible at the time of uh, making the registration in the iir um goods to be manufactured so uh, it's again uh, your outward cth nature of goods produced notification number sac code uh, though as of now uh, it doesn't say nature of services but uh, since it mentions about sac code so typically uh, uh, whatever are your description of outward services in case any importer is uh, the service output service provider he can mention the same under nature of goods produced and accordingly mention the sac code there uh, without mentioning the cth and uh, similarly here he can keep on adding the rows depending upon the nature of the uh, different services which he might be uh, providing and then there are job worker details name gstin address process at the unit nature of goods produced so till now there are job work uh, it is restricted to job worker details 
but uh, as i mentioned that uh, in future it will also include your inter unit transfer details it will also include your uh, specified end user details so those also need to be mentioned here in the iain again needless to mention all these details can be amended at any point in time before undertaking the uh, any respective transaction because they will be automatically populated in your uh, monthly return so uh, before undertaking any transaction it's better to uh, get them registered here now the, yeah. as we saw the second option bond bg i'll just uh, quickly run through this also uh, request type if you see in request type there are six different options amendment with amount amendment with bg details amendment with amount and bg details if both the things have to be amend, amended fresh bg is going to furnish some fresh with bg and uh, bg details fresh without bg so in this case uh, once you keep say, bond type bond number amount of bond category of bond so all these details once you fill in that case uh, if you select any of these uh, there will be another uh, different screens that would appear uh, with the requirement of uh, many other different uh, line items and uh, uh, information from you so i am not running into all these six different types um, and uh, thereafter uh, thereafter if we see similarly we have short receipt and uh, similarly we have file monthly return monthly return is exhaustive and uh, it has many auto populative uh, facilities also so as i mentioned you need uh, if you do not enter your iain or your bond number at the time of filing of your bill of entry then in that case that will not be populated while filing your monthly G uh, monthly return also so you will not be able to record that particular uh, uh, transaction that particular import and thereafter the benefit which you took on the import of the goods that will not be typically available for you so importer needs to be really caution on the fact that uh, they fill the correct bill of entry um, uh, with the uh, details and once they mention the iin the uh, importer needs to be caution that uh, all the relevant details are already registered in that particular iin also so if there is any new notification if there is any new cth if there is any new port from where he is uh, importing the goods if there is any new specified end use customer any new uh, job workup all those details are duly captured and amended in the iin uh, before the goods are imported so uh, uh, so that there is a clear track of all the goods imported and being uh, used either for the manufacturer or for the specified end use or for the output service provider one i have a question yes sir for igcr1 yeah. basically i prior information prior intimation is igcr1 Yes. So, do we have to fill it out every time before importing the consignment, or no? You don't have to fill it out every time before importing the assignment. As I said earlier, also that this is a one-time uh, intimation. Okay. However, yeah. if there is any change in any of the particulars which I uh, had shown to you, like uh, job worker details, or goods to be manufactured details, or goods to be imported details, or any manufacturer details, okay. then those changes needs to be carried out so that they are registered on your portal. श्वेता जी नारायण बोल रहा हूँ अभी ये यूआई का स्टेटस क्या है मैम ये डिजिटलाइजेशन के बारे में किसके बारे में सर यूआई यूआई नहीं यूआई का ये यूआई सेपा की बात कर रहे हैं नो यूआई ओके 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 सर वो अभी उसी में है डोलड्रम सेम सेम मैनुअल सेम 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 मैनुअल यूआई हैज नॉट बीन कॉन्फ़िगर्ड ऑन द पोर्टल एस ऑफ नाउ Okay. It's the same. So, sir, uh, it's already four uh, fifty. I think uh, we've already exceeded the time. I hope uh, these slides were useful to you. Uh, do provide us your feedback also. Uh, we would be glad to uh, take the feedback. And if you, in case you have any queries, you can mail to me or to Jain sir. Uh, I can see uh, some um, queries in the chat box also. Uh, uh to be very frank since we are running out of time uh, as of now i can't uh, answer these uh, queries but definitely i'll see these chats after i am done with the presentation and thereafter i'll uh, reply to uh, each and everyone each and everyone
हेलो यस सर श्वेता जी देयर इज अ स्मॉल क्वेरी दिस इज जस्ट अबाउट वन और टू मिनट्स एक्चुअली दिस इज दिस इज रिगार्डिंग द आईजीसीआर स्कोप राइट नाउ वी आर इंपोर्टिंग द गुड्स अगेंस्ट अंडर एडवांस ऑथराइजेशन और एलडीसी ओके सो इज इट एप्लीकेबल आईजीसीआर इज एप्लीकेबल ऑन दैट ऑन आवर इंपोर्ट नो 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 अभी नहीं not normal sir okay no not not now and in fact that is the confusion which that we mentioned the, the earlier oh, because if it is mentioned so then a lot of it will create the chaos so therefore in the notification itself we are still of the view in the notification itself it should be mentioned that you have to observe the import of goods at concessional rate of rules advance no, authorization there is an independent notification 18 by 2015 and yes, that yes. does not provide for observance of these rules okay so okay, we fine. need to really uh, the uh, department also needs to understand that uh, those two conditions should be read as and only and not or because if it is to be read as or then uh, it will yes, create sorry. utter chaos at the time of import because there are so many so many situations so many exemption notifications uh, which can be said uh, as if they are for specified end use what then and how the department will interpret specified end use how the importer interprets specified end use uh, it will lead to otherwise a lot Lot of litigation, but yes, I would again say that this needs clarity, and hopefully, some sh clarity should come on this. Okay, 